Good morning. It's good to see you all. If you're following along the books, the Song of Invitation will be number 333. Number 333. It's good to see you all. It's a little bit weird for me because uh, normally you have to tell people to move closer, and I think this is the first time in a long time since I've seen the front full. This is, this is great. Uh, we want to say welcome to all those visiting over the holiday um, or the upcoming holiday. We appreciate your presence, and it's been said a few times. Uh, be sure to get a welcome packet on the way out. If we can help you any way this week or today, be it through prayer, teaching you the gospel, maybe you have Bible questions. Yeah, you'll be our friend and just talk to any one of us. We'll be more than happy to. Uh, maybe you've done some studying and you want to obey the gospel. There'll be a time for that at the end of the lesson. Um, and you can come forward at that time or uh, maybe even go into the back and, and, and talk to one of our elders and uh, see about uh, getting the spiritual needs uh, filled that you may have. There was a story I heard one time I thought it would be a good way to start off this morning. Pretty humorous, I like to think it. it was. Uh, there was a young boy who lived in a small town. Let's pretend it was Mayberry. And... He had gone into the drugstore and asked the pharmacist if he could borrow the payphone or borrow the phone there. He said, yeah, and he'd make a, make a call, and sure enough, you hear the rotary go, and the, the pharmacist is only here one half of the conversation. So the boy, you finally hear, his, you hear him say, well, good afternoon, Mr. Anderson, or Dr. Anderson. Um, I am wondering if you were in the market to hire a boy to mow your lawn and do some yard work or run errands for you. The pharmacist starts leaning in a little bit more and the boy goes, oh, you already have a boy. Okay, okay. Does he do a good job? Are you happy with him? Oh, okay. You are happy with him. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you. And he hangs up the phone, returns it to the pharmacist, and he begins walking up and Dr. Anderson goes, hold up. I have room in my shop for an ambitious young man like yourself. I mean, he says, oh, oh, no, sir, I already have a job. Then why'd you call Dr. Anderson? You see, I work for Dr. Anderson. I was just checking in on myself, see what my job, how good I was doing. I tell you that because the subject of this morning's lesson, self-examination. Our source text for this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. So what that boy was doing was checking in on himself. It's one thing to receive praise when you're in front of the person. You know, there's some added peer pressure there. But if they don't know it's you or you're getting an anonymous survey, you can kind of really see where you're lacking and where you're uh, excelling at. I remember my college days that that was the big thing. At the end of every term, you had to fill out the teacher evaluations. And they had to leave the room and they had to pick a student to go bring it down so there was no possibility of them influencing your decision. And I, I still wonder how accurate those things are because if you were like me, I think I only gave, there was only one review that I ever, ever felt the need to say something actual reviewing. I'm getting the word lost. Because most of the time, I just want to get out of there. So I just check all the boxes and say, yeah, he's doing fine, doing fine, doing fine. Um, but the truth was, there was nothing excelling about the teacher or nothing poor about the teacher I felt the need to uh, highlight there. And if you excuse another tangent, well, the, the one time I gave a really bad one was Spanish 201 because I had just learned <laughs> a year of Spanish from a non-native speaker speaking uh, Castilian from Sonora. So this kind that we would hear here. And in 201, they threw me with a native-born Spaniard from southern Spain. And in southern Spain, everything has a very thick th on everything. So I can't understand a lick of what he's saying. And he's expecting us to be much higher than what we're supposed to. First, the whole first year is told, you don't need to know, know vosotros. No one uses vosotros. And then what do we get quizzed on? 201. Uh, you lose 10 points in this quiz because you didn't conjugate vosotros correctly. Like, the whole last year, no one told me. I hope it was accurate feedback for this professor because he needs to be teaching probably 301 or 401, not 201. And that's the key with self-examination and feedback. We want it to be accurate. You see, the Apostle Paul was one who received his fair share or unfair share of criticism. 
most of it undeserved. And at the end of the Corinthian correspondence, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul lays down this charge, this challenge to the Corinthians. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust you will know that you are not disqualified. The two words used in this text, examine and test, are really degrees of the same word. They're two different words, but the definitions, they, they're degrees of the same, same idea. The examine is to closely inspect or to test the quality of something. And the word for testing there is a more intense idea of this, that is testing with the intent to approve of. In fact, the Apostle Paul used that word um, in Thessalonians when he says that God has examined you or tested you to see that you are worthy of the gospel. He uses the idea there of you have been proved, you have been refined, you have been interviewed or taken through the ringer to see that you are of the genuine article. You know, we, we, we do this from time to time. I'm not sure, I'm, I forget the name of the store, but there's these advertisements online right, on, on TV right now of this upscale resale. And they, they have a team of experts to make sure that used Louis Vuitton bag you bought is real Louis Vuitton. Uh, there's this idea of you're going to spend that kind of money, you want it to be the genuine article. And this is the idea that Paul's talking about when he uses the word testing of, of proving the genuineness of this, of this quality of the thing. So why has Paul even laid down this challenge to begin with? Well... The second Corinthian letter was really the fourth Corinthian letter because there's a letter in between first and second because they had a lot of questions about to, that they needed to ask to Paul and there were some in Corinth who were trying to undercut Paul's authority. We, we can see that in the answers he gives in the second letter. For example, in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, it seems that some were claiming that Paul was cowardly and not bold. Hence why he has to defend himself when he says this in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beg you that I am, when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Paul's convoluted sentence right there basically is, I'm bold to you now in my letters, so that I will not have to be bold to you when I'm in person. I have every intent to deal with these people who are accusing me of, of, me, of, of weakness and uh, being timid about the gospel. But I hope it is not to you as the entire congregation. I hope it's only these detractors that I'm going to have to do this. It's not in my notes, but another thing we need to point out here is, in verse 2, some are accusing that the apostles were simply charlatans. They were using this for personal gain. They were living hypocritical lives because he says in verse 2, says, who think of us as if though we walked according to the flesh. Well, no, we don't. But some are saying that. He says in chapter 11 and verse 6, some, it seemed, were accusing him of not being trained in speech and not having the real knowledge of Christ. He says, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge but we have been thoroughly manifest among you in all things. Yeah, it's true. I didn't, I didn't do Toastmasters. I didn't have speech training. But I am trained in the knowledge of Christ. I may be tedious and hard to listen to, but I know 100% what I'm saying and the doctrine I'm teaching. He has to say further that he was a real apostle because the accusation further in 7, 8, and 9 of chapter 11 is that some were saying that, well, you're not a real apostle because you didn't take any money. You didn't take wages for the Corinthians. And you know the only reason you didn't take a wage from the Corinthians is because you, knew, you know you're a charlatan. And Paul has to say in verse 7 of chapter 11, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted as I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister you. 
And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. Basically, his whole point there is, maybe I should have taken wages from you, because this would have avoided the whole situation. He says, I robbed other churches, one of which was the Philippians and the brethren at Macedonia. They were supporting him. When it became that wasn't enough, he went out and got a job. He was bending over backwards for the Corinthians' support and their benefit. And yet, some said, well, you can't trust that, Paul. And the icing on the cake is verse 11. Why did he do all these things? Because I did not love you? God knows I do. Some were accusing him, you don't love us. That's why you're just, you're just trying to be a despot to us. You're just trying to rule over us. Anyone who has taught or preached in any capacity, anyone who's had a close friendship um, that was no longer there, um, can understand what Paul's going through. Somebody completely misreading the situation or after a, after a long time of being friends and having close companionship would turn around and level all sorts of accusations against you that have no basis and no merit. Hence why, and I say all this to provide the context for what we're at read in chapter 13, verse 5. It says, basically, Paul is saying, it is not I who needs testing. It is you, Corinthians, to see whether or not you're actually in the faith. Now, Paul is confident that they will be found in the faith. This is the middle of the verse. He says, do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed don't pass the test? He hopes that they do, and he is assured that many of them will, but he lays down that challenge because it's basically, you need to look in the mirror before you start saying all these things about me. Having set the context, this is not the only verse in Scripture that talks about the need for self-examination. Granted, much of which comes from the Corinthian correspondence, but there's this need for self-examination. Um, There is a need because we are very good at deceiving ourselves. We're very good at not seeing things accurately when it comes to ourselves. Case in point, there's a reason why very few of us like to listen to our voices on recording. That's the accurate presentation of our voice. What we hear in our head is very, it's how we perceive our own voice. And we think we sound great. Anyone who's sang in the shower thinks they sound, sound great. But then we hear the recording like, oh, how do people tolerate me? (laughs) Hopefully you learn to love it. But when we examine ourselves, when we're confronted with the truth, oftentimes we don't like it. We like to live in our own little bubble. I like to think I'm a good singer. I like to think I I can hit those high notes. The truth matters, I can't. So Paul in 1 Corinthians, when dealing with the abuses of many things in the Corinthian church, makes his point about their pride in one regard. You see, in in the 1 Corinthian letter, you had some who were, well, the first three chapters, some were bragging about, well, I was taught by Apollos, I was taught by Cephas, you know, my teacher's better than your teacher. They were being arrogant in their trusting of men. You had some who were bragging about their sexual immorality in chapters 5 and 6 and 7. Um, in fact, you had even 11, the whole, I believe the whole thing there with the covering is dealing with the fact you had some who were going into temple, temples where it was customary to have men look like women and women look like men, and you didn't know where one body stopped and another one began. That was the cultural context of pagan worship in that city. Some were bragging like, yeah, I have a right to that. You had a man who bragged that he had his father's wife. Even Paul said, even that's not even heard among the Gentiles. What's wrong with you people? And they were bragging. They're prideful about this. Hence why he says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He says, you haven't fallen yet, but you need to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror because you're dangerously close to falling away. He says in the 11th chapter, in verse 28, in context of the Lord's Supper, 
They also were abusing the Lord's Supper in that they were making it into a common meal. Some were getting drunk, some were engaging in gluttony, and others were going without anything. They showed lack of care and concern for their brethren and a lack of respect for the Lord and his table. Hence why he says in 28 of chapter 11, But let a man examine himself, and in so doing, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That is, examine yourself in that do you have the right understanding of the Lord and his table? And we touched on this last week. Really, the way you do that, practically speaking, is look at your life. Is your life characterized? Could it be reflective of somebody who understands that Jesus died for you and redeemed you? Or do you treat the Lord flippantly and commonly? That's what the Corinthians were doing. Over in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4. Sometime later, about, I believe it's about five or six years later, Paul writes this letter. Galatians were dealing with another issue. Some had come in and were teaching that in order to be saved, you had to do what the Bible teaches, believe, repent, be baptized, and you know, Acts 2.38. But in addition to that... You gotta keep the food laws. You gotta observe the feast days. You've got to do all these extra things. And Paul says, no, you don't. That's, an, that's antithetical to what the gospel teaches. But he says here of them, of these false teachers, starting in verse 3 of chapter 6. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and when he uh, will, he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. This whole idea in these scriptures is the, uh, is the concept of seeing ourselves rightly, of taking the long, hard look at ourselves and being honest with our warts and all. And I'm not saying this as an easy thing. It's one of the hardest things anyone can do. One of the hardest things, one of the most unpleasant things, let me reward that, that I have done and occasionally do, much to Kurt's rejoicing, is I will re-watch the live stream. Am I doing anything distracting in the pulpit? How am I wording this point? What are my mannerisms like? It's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> but if the goal is improvement, you need the self-reflection and examination. It's why in uh, professional sports, they will oftentimes record like pitching practices and they'll replay the tapes in slow motion to see, is there anything, any veritables in your pitching arm? Are you, is you, are you throwing a straight line? It's why they record uh, scrimmage games in the NFL so you can analyze the tapes and see how they're playing, see how you're doing as a team. It's absolutely needed. And it's necessary if I want to grow as a Christian. So the question is, how do I do it? You know, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.18, we understand this admonition that we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And self-reflection is absolutely necessary to that. Our starting point with growth and self-examination is prayer. We need God's help if we're going to see ourselves rightly because we deceive ourselves. We are deceptive and we are marred with the weaknesses of this body and our understandings. And we can get blinders up and we can, get, we can have all these biases in which cloud our judgment. So we need God's help in this. David prayed in two different psalms. In Psalm 26 in verse 2. Psalm 26 and verse 2, David prays, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. He wanted the Lord, and it may be more clear in Psalm 139, excuse me, that I'm incapable of seeing myself accurately. I need God's shifting, if you will, his examination. I need him to examine my ways, my thoughts, my steps, to see if they are accurate and true and just and right and everything we, we strive to be. In the 139th Psalm, in verses 23 and 24,
in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, David prays, and really this whole psalm is about God's perfect knowledge of man, but he prays at the end, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This is not some sort of subjective emotional shifting that God's going to do. It's not some sort of subjective searching. God has given us how, given us a tool by which we can be searched and shifted. And that goes to James chapter 1. We need to start with prayer. And the prayer will often be answered through the message revealed. Um, James likens the Word of God, and if you want to turn there in chapter 1, we'll read this in just a moment. James likens the Word of God to a mirror. So we go over to James 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 21 to begin with, and we're going to read through 27. James writes, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a, a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Most of us woke up this morning, I'm being kind, uh, most of us got up this morning and looked in the mirror, and we saw bedhead morning breath and all. And most of us, again, I don't know perfectly, I'm just going to say most, we took a shower, brushed our teeth, combed our hair. Um, very few of us would think that, okay, I'm going to roll out of bed and just go out like this. Um, after all, services is not Walmart. Uh, okay. We all saw ourselves, and we made the necessary changes. And so when it comes to examining ourselves, we've prayed to God that he would do, this, do so. We need to then turn to the word that he has given us so we would know how we stack up. How do we look in God's mirror? And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll wager, you're never going to look into the mirror of God and not find some imperfection. There is always something to improve upon. The day in which we no longer have to improve is when Christ comes back and we're all glorified and, and given our immortal bodies and we can dwell with God forever. Until that day, there is always another day of improvement. So the question is, when we see what we're doing, for example, James gives us an example. Um, verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue... Okay, if I read in the scriptures, for example, that James says further in chapter 3, in verse 2, he says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in, a word, in word, he is a perfect man, able to brow the whole body. Indeed, we, and he goes on to give a couple of illustrations, but he's talking about who can tame the tongue, who can perfectly say what they mean to say all the time, every time. Very few of us. I would maybe wager none of us. Um, you know, words are tricky, especially English. <laughs> and so James gives an example in the letter here is, okay, if you see what the Word of God teaches about speech, be undefiled, pure, uh, able to give grace to those who hear, that is, Christian speech should be refreshing to the people around you. If I see that, and I've prayed for God's guidance, I need to reflect upon that, okay? Could my speech be characterized that way? I have the honesty to say, give an honest answer. Maybe a yes or no. If it's no, how can I improve upon that? I would look further in the scripture. What, how does God describe my speech? What is edifying speech? What is speech that is graceful? What is speech that builds up? 
And it's funny that we talked a little bit this in our class this morning on Acts. The world's kind of known this for a little bit. They have all their funny acronyms in, in public school. Um, I don't remember the one acronym. I know, remember one in first grade. It was kind. Your speech must be kind. It all stood for different things. The idea was you weren't going to say anything that was going to be hurtful or tearing down or, 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 or mean to anyone. That when you spoke, it was going to be something that encouraged or was good or was joyful. Uh, something that was in, you know, good for each other, good for the person to hear. Not the opposite. Uh, and finally, you know, you know self-examination con continues with the word, looking into it, that perfect mirror. And finally, and we touched on this, when you see what the word teaches, you prayed for God's guidance, you have to examine the fruit of your life. Jesus in Matthew 7 and verse 16, speaking of false prophets, but the principle applies. Speaking of false prophets, he said, you will know them by their fruits. Earlier in the gospel, in chapter 3 and verse 18, when many of the religious leaders came to John the Baptist for baptism, he said, who warned you, you brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That is, there ought to be a tangible change in your life based on what you have done here today, is what John's saying. So I, myself, have to look at the fruit of my life. And that's what this last point is about before the lesson is yours. Um, these next questions are not original to me. Um, I read a good article by Ken Williver on his blog, The Preacher's Word. He did a small little article, The Word of the Week, Self-Examination or Examination. He offered more questions than I have time here to deal with, about, I think, 15 or 17 of them. I offer you six or seven. It's questions that get us started to think about, well, how do I, how do I examine the fruit of my life? The big one is, would you describe your life, or is your life characterized by overwhelmingly by righteousness or unrighteousness? If you were to ask your equivalent of Dr. Anderson anonymously, how would you describe, you know, how would you describe Brett or Bob? Would that person say good things or not so great things? Would they say that this person's a person of integrity and godliness and righteousness, or says, well, he means well. Um, or he, 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 you know, he doesn't always say the best things all the time, or he's an acquired taste. Um, people aren't like coffee. At least they shouldn't be. It shouldn't be an acquired taste. Start with that. Uh, we were talking about the speech. Is your speech wholesome? That is, would it benefit people? Do people benefit from being around you? Do you speak things that are true and noble and right and encouraging and uplifting, or is the opposite true? Do you regularly read the Bible? That's another one. Because we're not going to have the mirror of the Word if we're not engaging with the Word. Um, I ought to have some sort of daily engagement um, be it a couple chapters a day or even just listening on my commute. Uh, there's many different ways we can engage with the Word. But I would, I would check myself first. I'm like, am I, do I have any engagement with the Word? If you don't, I would say that's a good place to start. start. Is, your worship att is your attendance at worship faithful or sporadic? You know, we... Um, this, this, the disclaimer here there's no perfect attendance award in heaven. We need to get that out of our head, okay? Um, but it's a barometer. How important are the people of God? How important is the things of God? How important is what God has said for me to engage in? How important is that? That's why it's a good, it's a good temperature gauge. Am I placing value on the things of God or not? And I would just look at, okay, how often are you engaging with the people of God? And on the flip side... Yes, there's no attendance award for heaven. And on the flip side, just because you show up every service doesn't mean anything either. Are you engaging with the people of God outside of the public assembly? That's also important. And do I value my brethren? I can't answer that for you. 
Are your professed values, that is, the faith that you profess, is it reflected in your day-to-day life? If you, do you say the amen that lying is a sin, but then cheat on your tax return? And believe me, I know it's tempting. It's Uncle Sam. We got to think about it. Do you profess that we should be, since speech is the topic of the hour, our speech should be wholesome and uplifting? But Monday morning, we engage in water cooler gossip about the, you know, what coworker so and so did over the weekend. Do we talk behind our boss's back, saying things that we would not dare say to their face? Does my professed values line up with my actions? And finally, is, is, is my heart right with God? And this one is, again, I can't answer any of these questions for any of us. Like, oh, only myself, really. And the only way my, I know my heart is right with God is if I've been reading his word and I know I'm standing truthfully and firmly on what he has said. Um, Self-examination is, I would say, rarely pleasant, but it's necessary. It's necessary for further growth. It's necessary if I want to mature as a Christian. And so I would encourage us all as we're entering that season in which New Year's resolutions will be made, maybe spend the next month and a half engaging in some self-reflection. Think about what areas do you want to improve upon the next year. And I also would say, don't wait until the next year to start improving upon them. If you know there's an area you need to improve upon, begin today. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the mirror of your word. And we pray, Father, that as we examine our own lives and the fruit that is in them, that you would search us. You would expose to us our weaknesses and our faults that we may confess them that you would lead us in the right way. You would guide us into the path of righteousness. Father, we pray that the words spoken here today was true and right and accurate. And we pray, Father, that we would examine ourselves so we would see that we are indeed in the faith. So your son's name we pray. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize your heart isn't right with God. Or maybe you don't even know how, if, how to tell if your heart's right with God or not. Um, you know, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, there's a whole crowd there gathered that they had to do some self-reflection. The Apostle Peter and the rest of the Apostles had preached some hard words that the Jesus who was the Lord that they needed to call upon to be saved from Joel This Jesus who was attested in by miracles which they all saw. This is the Jesus who was the subject of biblical prophecy. This is the Jesus that was shown to be the Son of God by power of resurrection. They all were the ones guilty of his death. And we don't know how big the crowd was. We just know at least 3,000 that day took a long, hard look at themselves and went, yeah, I'm the man. I killed Jesus. I, I shouted, crucify him. In fact, one man in particular in verse 38 of Acts 2, excuse me, verse 37, interrupts the sermon. Yeah, you can almost picture, he goes, from the back, what do I do to be saved? He was so convicted that moment, interrupting the sermon, like, I need to be saved now. And Peter says in verse 38, the word of God says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many are one words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that they were at about 3,000 souls. That's what the Bible teaches for salvation. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never done that, you would like to, we can assist you this morning. Maybe you need to say that further. Maybe you need prayers. Sin that needs confessing or 
prayers of encouragement or strength, we invite you to come and see how we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>